Welcome once again. Let's talk about urban planning. Today we explore a topic that often goes unnoticed in urban planning, which is the role of young people in shaping today's smart cities. And we have the pleasure of welcoming Simeon Tubunayev from the Birmingham City University. So he will tell, but together we will talk about uh, young people's perceptions, values, so the key considerations for planners about this. We focus uh, this conversation uh, on a question. How can we shape the future of our cities with the voices of the next generation? So let's jump into it. Simeon, welcome. Hi, welcome, Dan. And thanks for having me on the on the podcast. It's fantastic. Um, it's a very good question. I mean, I didn't have the framing, but that's a very good question. I think very pertinent question. And it's really nice that you opened it up beyond mm -hmm. just smart cities, but also just future cities as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's quite a key distinction as well. Um, yeah, do you have any questions for me or do you want me to just go into um, background of the paper? Yeah, Sorry. so um, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to give you uh, to start this conversation. So the main message of your article is the importance of engaging with young people in shaping future cities, smart city initiatives. Can you elaborate on that, about the importance of this research? Yes, so smart cities people might have been familiar with for quite a while, since 20, 2010s. Um, it became a visionary, an idea about the future city that took a lot of root specifically with politicians and specifically with decision makers and budget holders. And um, there was a lot of pushback um, from sort of social sciences and urban planning where um, some of those visions were very technocratic, very much rooted in efficiency, rooted in um, computer science, um, and there was a shift towards human-centric visions. But in that shift, um, that sort of multiplicity of voices of what does it mean to have a human-centric vision just kind of got lost, I think. Um, and from my perspective, my interest was, well, who has the least amount of power in the decision-making process? Um, when I set out on this research, I was really looking at citizens' power and citizen power relationship in the smart city context. And actually, when you start thinking um, children and teenagers are quite often the least um, consulted, don't have enough um, financial power, don't have enough political power, they don't have um, a lot of the levers that maybe other groups of society could uh, utilize in sort of getting their voice heard. So for me, that was really interesting. And I was thinking if I'm going to test smart cities as a vision for our future, youth is, a, is the bit that is really, really key to engage. And it probably in my view is if you're actually doing a proper future city vision, um, that's a good test to see if you're actually really engaging everybody because if you know if the ones without power engaged then yeah that makes makes the most sense of course sense. yeah i would i would like to explore a little bit is what just said um this question is twofold now i would like to go deeper into the relevance um of the topic and under understand specifically so what was missing before and who are in your article who are these young people so who was the focus of your research specifically so well, as I was saying, there was a lot of research um, which emerged around how do we how do we actually construct smart city visions um, with people. So, uh, you know, in collaboration and co-creation models. Um, but when you talk about people, so that's where the kind of the research gap was. Um, you know, it was about in engaging people, but not which people and also how. Um, so for me, Teenagers became um, a demographic which I've worked with in the past. I've been an educator in secondary schools and so on. And for me, that was a demographic which is really interesting to think about, okay, if we're talking about people-centered um, smart cities, we should be really be thinking as well, who are the people? So for me, that 15 to 19 year old um, group of young people who are just about getting their you know, citizen rights and voting rights and becoming uh, workers and you know, contributors to the economy, and how are we actually engaging them in, in the creation of those visions? Um, so that was very important. And I think that was the gap in the research, and it's still quite a big gap, I think, you know, when we talk about creating future visions, is, is how do you actually create an intersectional and intergenerational um, kind of body of, of, of collaborators to actually create that? So it's not just technocratic decisions, and you know, there is space for that. But when co-creation is considered, it needs to be intersectional. OK. So. Let's jump into the findings. What can you tell us about that? 
Well, I mean, one thing which I always um, find quite surprising is when you actually talk to teenagers. So I talked to 121 teenagers across four contexts. So Manchester and Birmingham in, in the UK, um, and then Valencia in, in Spain and Sofia in Bulgaria. So there was a bit of a European context, but from uh, three different nations. Um, everybody talks about how young people are very digitally savvy. Actually, the perception of young of youth was quite negative about that. They didn't feel as, as confident. So it's really interesting that there was a key reflection um, about them being as users of, of digital technology um, and then actually, you know, creators of, so what does that mean for the smart cities if you have a population that doesn't necessarily feel confident in using some of the smart tools? Um, there was critical engagement missing in the urban realm. Uh, people were, uh, they weren't entirely sure about how to engage, what urban technologies are, uh, but there were a lot of similarities, a lot of priorities such as health, safety, education, uh, which are all kind of missing from a lot of smart city models, were top priority for that generation. Um, also sustainability and post anthropocentric models. So how do we engage um, different parts of, um, you know, sort of animals and, and, and fauna and, and, and so on um, in, in the way that we plan the city. So it was really interesting to see how many nuances there were and how teenagers were really, really able to understand that there is a shift in the way that we plan our cities and how that shift is actually engaged, you know, being controlled, um, how that shift is being kind of channeled in funding and, and, and really kind of able to advise on that. I think that was that was quite surprising for me um, that there was a lot of nuance. A lot of people spoke about policies, especially in the UK, mixed communities and things like that came up um, and also talking about post-capitalist models as well, which was really interesting. Of course, and I, I would like to follow on that. I'm I'm curious about now about the policy impacts because well they're teenagers as you said so and because there's a geographical diversity as you indicated. How do you see um, the policymakers or other actors using research like this to inform to shape policies related to urban planning and development of smart cities? Yeah, so I think I mean there is a big myth that teenagers are not hard to connect to and uh, to kind of engage. That's not true. If you actually go and ask them, it's quite easy. Um, so I think one of the bits is actually when you start planning uh, a process, think about who do you actually engage? How do you actually engage them? Um, I think also for an individual level, there could be more critical engagement with the planning of the cities. So, um, you know, when a city vision gets announced, do people actually engage with that? And on an educational level, do, you know, do young people get thought about that? Um, and I think for planners, I think when you actually start defining a project, um, that should be a demographic that you should be thinking about, okay, how do we include that? But I think there is a bigger issue as well, and we talked about the smart city domain, that a lot of smart city visions don't necessarily rest with the planning and the urban planning departments. Quite often it's um, eco economists or um, technology, you know, tech departments that are actually dealing with the smart city planning, uh, which even though it has a spatial element, doesn't necessarily kind of correlate with the planner. So I think there is another bigger question, which maybe urban planning has some of those answers and it has done some of that engagement in the past, but we really need to be reaching beyond those silos and really be saying, you know what, actually, if, you, if you're gonna be doing a, uh, a future city vision, which is going to impact spatially, we should be talking to all the people that, that live in the area. So I think it could be a nice wake up, wake up call and also a nice cross section between um, to kind of start a conversation maybe with your colleagues in a different department or so on. Um, yeah. Of course, it's so a bigger stage for urban playing and also uh, teenagers as valuable. So their voices is more valuable than what people would expect. And based on this, I'm interested in the possibilities. So you touched upon this a bit. I'm interested in the possibilities that your research creates for future research. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, what are now some uh, promising avenues for further study in this field? How can, as you said, researchers and planners uh, listening to this episode have a further understanding of youth engagement in smart city planning? So youth engagement as a whole in urban planning is an under-researched topic. So there is plenty there mm -hmm. uh, to kind of dig into. I think in the smart city uh, planning field, there is a lot to think about the digital tools that actually could be used. I think there is an, um, a lot of funding and a lot of research going into how do we actually um, create that interface between citizens uh, and the smart city or whatever, you know, whatever the smart city takes shape as. Um, so there is, there is opportunity there. There is opportunity as well to really kind of do a full-blown um, cross-national research beyond just three contexts to understand if the values are actually 
um, overlapping because in my research, the trends were very, very similar, even though the context was very, very different. So there is some generational um, kind of alignment around what the priorities um, are at that age. So that would be something interesting to, to look at. And also after COVID, I mean, my research was impacted by COVID. So after COVID, there is a lot to discuss mm -hmm. about um, how health um, has actually kind of risen up, up, up the priority, uh, especially with young people. So it's really, really interesting to, to think a bit about, okay, all those visions that we developed about smart cities before COVID, are they still serving the same population? and um, you know, how are we going ahead with it? And I think obviously on the climate side, um, a lot of the young people are very, very skeptical about whether smart cities are the answer because they're saying, okay, that's fine, but you know, it's still creating new emissions. It's still kind of dealing uh, with that presumption of growth. Um, so actually that was, I was really surprised about that, but um, yeah, there is, there, are, there is research there to realign some of those visions and to really think critically how, how we're testing them. So the next, whenever the next crisis comes, we're not necessarily having to scratch everything, but there are better frameworks, yeah. Of course, yeah. And so with so many to explore still, um, research and not research, are there any additional materials that for our listeners for our listeners, would be interested in delving deeper into this topic? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the bits, obviously, is the special issue of the, of the journal, because this sure. is part of a special issue on smart cities. And there is actually, I was reading some of the other papers, and there's a really, really nice rounded um, view of, of what smart city um, literature is at the moment. Uh, we published at Birmingham City University some podcasts called Driver of Change, and one of them is on youth inclusion, so that's, that might be something accessible for people to, to listen to. And similarly, um, there is a podcast, Green Thinking, on the BBC3, which I was contributing to, um, which is about youth and activism, so if people are interested on that, um, that would be another, another angle to, to, to hear about. Um, and maybe the Thought and Education Trust, that's another charity in the UK, which has been collating a lot of planners, architects, and other people engaging with young people um, and sort of collating a bit of a database. So that might be an interesting place for people to go and look and understand how they can engage young people in their own work, whether they're doing smart city planning or just urban planning more generally. Okay, that's very good. And if you are watching uh, for those who are watching this episode on the let's talk about urban planning websites below you can find uh, the recommended materials that Simon just got us including of course the thematic issues some some, some self-promotion both from our part and uh, Simeon so all the materials are uh, below the video of this episode Simeon let's wrap this episode up what would you say is the uh, the key punchline or the main takeaway from today's conversation so in a nutshell what should our listeners remember and consider when it comes to involving young people in the planning uh, of future cities? Um, I've worked with young people for the last 12 years, um, and obviously I've, I've been a young person before that. So one thing which I always think, and it comes very strong from the, from the paper, is young people are not a homogenous group. You know, teenagers are not a homogenous group. There is as much nuance and as much variety and complexity in that group as in any other. And they are also capable of generating variety and complexity and a lot of nuanced uh, opinions, which actually quite often are quite informed because you know, with the knowledge economy, people are out there learning new information from anywhere. So it doesn't matter what age they are, if they really want to, to learn something, they go and do it. So that's the one thing I would say, just shift your perceptions of teenagers actually um, imagine them as a more complex and nuanced group and go and actually discuss some of those issues with them. You know, that's the main takeaway. Sure. Inspiring and promising. Simeon, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. For our watchers, if you are watching us on YouTube, you can find all the resources. As I said before, all the materials have this conversation on the Let's Talk About Urban Planning website. And you can also listen to this episode, um, whatever you get your podcast.